Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It's so good to be here tonight for another installment as we go through and the book of Revelation and study God's word. I bless God for each and every one of you tonight, and I bless God for your faithfulness, those of you who have been uh, so faithful and attentive to this season of study. Feel free to give me a shout out and I will uh, respond in kind. Again, I just trust that you all are doing well and staying prayerful during this season. We're going to trust God like never before. And we're going to uh, just pray and seek his face. And during this time, we're going to give him praise for what he has done in our lives. He's done great things in the midst of all of this. So God bless you, Christine McDuffie. God bless you, Kim Davis. God bless you, Tamika Tick Ford. God bless you, Karen Hodo. So glad you're all here. Uh, Sabernia Thompson, God bless you. Deacon Kevin Massey, God bless you, sir. Bless God for you and your cousin, Pastor David Massey. Amen. Brother Rob Hubbard is in the house. We bless God for him. Amen. Annie, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Wendy Drexler Morero is here to kill a hunter. Bishop Dr. Eddie Terrell Ball. Amen. Dean Flickup. Amen. Y'all are jumping on quickly tonight. Uh, this is wonderful. Wendy, God bless you. Latoria Hutchins, God to have you tonight. We bless God for each and every one of you. Dawn Harold Lopez, this is your night tonight with your two witnesses uh, that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, Shronda Bell's in the house, Sonia Rosser, uh, B, B. Regina Williams, God bless you. Madam President, amen. Glenda Stephan Williams, Glenda Stephens, I don't know where I got the Williams from, but we're glad that you're here. Dean Flickup says, hello, family, and we are a family. Amen. Monique Sirius is here tonight. Amen. Nicole R. Scott is here tonight. Karen Watson is here tonight. Bless God. Amen. Thank you so much, Wendy. Amen. I picked this shirt out tonight. Amen. I picked this out. Amen. From the store myself back in the store days. Dawn said, oh, I'm on time tonight. Dawn Harold Lopez says she's on time tonight. And uh, we bless God uh, for you, Dawn. Amen. India James is in the house tonight. Felicia Moore. Uh, this is the time for us all to come together as family and to study as family and to learn as family. Uh, Jacqueline Carter says, good evening, everyone. God bless you. Praise God, Dean, man. You've been so faithful to this. Uh, it's a, such an awesome thing to watch and to witness what God is doing um, in your life. Amen. Kelly Mason from Cincinnati. God bless you. Oh, my goodness. Praise God. Dwayne Jackson's in the house tonight. Amen. Thank you so much. We bless God. There's 52 people on already, and we haven't even really gotten warmed up or started yet. So we just bless God for that. Let's take uh, three more minutes and say hello to everybody, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Teresa McDonald says, blessings to all. Again, we're all in this together. We are family. Amen. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, where you were born, your nationality. We are all family. <laughs> God bless you, Mr. Ball. No, I've got to give that to you. Uh, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, and uh, you've been faithful, amen, to this. You were doing this while I was uh, a preacher in terms of being licensed and have, and being ordained, but uh, music was more of a priority back then, and I had to take several whippings from God. So um, anyway, we just bless God for you and your presence, and I pray Mom can come on as well tonight amen i believe that she'll probably will be here soon oh wow okay cassandra Pugh. okay all right is that such a spiritual brother or or your your real brother dean flick up let me know deborah ann red canard is with us tonight julie young says i'm here amen thank you all for being here one more minute i'm gonna go ahead and get started go ahead and get your bibles out let's get ready uh, to jump in and uh, get something to write with. There's going to be some notes that's going to go through this, go with this. Amen. God bless you, Dwayne Jackson. Appreciate you, man. So faithful, man. I mean, you've been here every night. This is like the 17th night in a row. I don't know how many people know that. And, um, you know, at first I'd only planned on just going through Revelation, just take seven days and just go through uh, the basics of it. And then uh, I felt led to to go ahead on and, and uh, go through this thing and teach it no matter how long it takes. And 
and, and be faithful every night and don't worry about who comes or who doesn't come or who shows up, who doesn't show up. But it's a blessing I, I, that you all are here. I don't take it lightly like I always say that you're here. But, but I said, you know what? If one person comes on, I'm going to teach and uh, we'll just go forward and we're just going to go through this. So I, I just bless God. God has been blessing us. And you're right. I mean, this, this is half a month we've been doing at this. And uh, Dwayne Jackson says time has flown by. And I just believe that we're going to look up uh, at one point and this season of shelter in place will be over and and uh, all of this will, uh, will, be, will be over. And uh, we're just going to prayerfully wait and trust God during the season. All right, my mom, Della Ball, is here. And uh, like I said, she would be, amen, I prophesied that right into existence, amen. Thank you so much, India James. I appreciate that. Nicole R. Scott. Thank you so much for putting a watch party in effect. Amen. Praise God. Delmita walking in Terrell, walking in victory, Terrell. Got your message. Amen. Good evening, Mom. Love you much. Sherry Brown. Cassandra Pugh. Praise God. Amen. That's why we're here. Valerie Dawkins. Will Williams. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you and thank you for right now. Thank you, God, for each and every person who's on tonight. We pray for your anointing, God. Through your word, God, we ask, God, that you would use us, God, as a conduit, God, to be able to uh, teach your word as you speak to us, God. We know that your word will speak, God, and your word will illuminate, God, through the Holy Spirit. So we pray tonight for power, God, in each and every, every one of us, God, your power to be upon each and every one of us that we may learn, God. We thank you, God, for your word, and we thank you for this time. Be with us, God, in this season, God, those of us who have taken time to learn, God, we want to read and know and understand your word more than ever before. Have mercy, God, on this world, God. Have mercy on us, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Bless God. Thank you for all being here. Shamal Rawls, God bless you, man. Uh, I was thinking about you the other day, and I bless God uh, for you, my friend. Amen. Uh, Mom Ball's here. Uh, Dr. Terrell Ball is here. So, uh, Y'all all family, we're in good company tonight. Angelina Harris is here tonight. Get out your Bibles because if you don't get out your Bibles, uh, looking at me is going to be quite boring because uh, I'm not going to spin around like a top. I'm not going to speak in tongues. I have no entertainment for you. Uh, any preacher in their right mind would not try to entertain you and keep you hype through the book of Revelation. It, it's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, there should be enough in the book in and of itself. To, to awaken you where somebody won't have to entertain you. So if you came by and thought I was going to give you a show, um, I love you too, Shamar, man. You mean a lot to me, man. If, if you think I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a show, if that's what you need, you're, you're going to quickly move on to the next live session that somebody else has, or you'll turn to TV, see what's on Netflix. But it's got to, this is Bible study. I have no tricks, and, and I, I wouldn't play with God like that, not with this book. And if you want somebody else... Uh, if you want a clown, you hire a clown, but uh, I, I can't clown through this tonight. That is too important of a book. It's too prevalent of a time. It's too important of a season. This is very important. Again, so I can't entertain you. If you're looking for entertainment, go ahead on to Netflix and, and, you know, God bless you. But if you're ready to study the word, get your Bible, get your Bible, get your Bible, get something to write with. I can't entertain you. Okay, here we go. Um, what you're doing tonight and what you've been doing with this study, you are setting yourself up to be blessed because Revelation, the first chapter and the third verse says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. See, you're in the position right now. God bless you, Roland Syria. God bless you, man. You are in the position to be blessed. Do you know the, uh, the, a lot of the church world is not in the position to be blessed because of this, because they won't turn to the prophecy of this book. They'll go right past uh, Jude. They'll go through Jude, go right past Revelation and go into the table of contents or, contents, or they'll go into the index or they'll go to, into the concordance of their Bibles or they go to close the book completely, but they avoid Revelation like the plague because they don't understand it, but and they think it's all doom and gloom here. But it says, if you know where you're at, 
if you know your place, if you know your place in God, your place in terms of the doctrine of eschatology, which is the doctrine of last things, if you understand your place, you'll understand that where the judgments take place, the church is going to be raptured up. You're not going to be here for it. So you might as well just see what's going to happen so you can tell somebody else and share the word. But it says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. You can't keep it if you don't know it. You can't keep it if you don't know it because you haven't read it. You're getting ready to be blessed. I don't know about you, but in this season, I want to be blessed. I want to please God. So how many of you tonight, you want to please God? Let's get into it. Let me give you a quick introduction. Just turn to Revelation, the, the 11th chapter, and just leave it open for a minute. And don't turn ahead. Let me just kind of kind of, uh, kind of, softly bring you into the, or, or lightly bring you into it. In the first 14 verses of chapter 11, it continues with the interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets. And in the concluding verses, we have the blowing of the seventh trumpet, which we're going to read about in verse 15. In this chapter, we learn that 42 months, which is three and a half years, remain of the times of the Gentiles, which we will explain, and that there are two witnesses that Don Harold Lopez has been talking about since we've even opened the book of Revelation, who will prophesy for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years, okay? Uh, we also have the second woe, and then the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The three woes are mentioned in Revelation 8 and 13. We remember that. Revelation 8, 8 and 13 says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet the sound. This is all taking place during the tribulation period. And the judgments are that are going to be poured out are, are, are just, uh, just amazing. I mean, they are catastrophically amazing, if I could put it in that way. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vile judgments. And with each one uh, that takes place, the intensity increases and, and it increases upon those things that happen on that are going to happen on the earth and it's going to be a terrible time you're not going to want to be here for that when the fifth angel sounded the, the trumpet in the revelation ninth, ninth chapter the scripture declares in revelation 9 and 12 one woe is past and behold there comes two woes more hereafter and then we learn about that second woe when it says that when the sixth angel sounded in the trumpet in Revelation 19, the scripture declares in Revelation 11 and 14 that the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. As we dwell, delve into Revelation chapter 11, this is one of the most important and one of the most compelling chapters in Revelation. There are at least five reasons why this is true. And we've got to keep in mind that everything that we start to read here is part of the message that was in the little book that John uh, ate. He took it from the angel. Remember that angel that we read about uh, who had one foot on heaven and one foot on earth? John was instructed uh, from a voice from heaven to take the book and to eat of it. And uh, we know that it was sweet to the mouth but bitter to the soul and we are supposed to ingest God's word and take it in and that way we can really preach it. You can't take it in until you internalize it. So one of the reasons why this book is so, so, so compelling where we're getting rid of this chapter is because one, it points to the rebuilding and destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. Everything that we're getting ready to be, read about takes stage in Jerusalem. Again, I've always said this, those of you that may be watching me for the first time, uh, again, when President Donald Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, I, it, it chills went through me because that was lining up everything uh, prophetically for what is going to take place. Jerusalem is the center stage, the temple, 
uh, uh, it, the destruction of the of the temple is important. So it points to the rebuilding and destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. We're going to be reading about that. Another reason why this this particular chapter is compelling because it shows the destruction of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. Another reason why, why this book is compelling because it ties in with the prophecies of our Lord and of scripture about the end time and the Antichrist. I'm going to give you some scripture, scriptorial examples so you'll know what we're, we're, we're not just making this stuff up. Another reason why it covers the great salvation of Israel and the coming kingdom of God. It gives us a glimpse as to how Israel will be saved and how God will conquer the evil corruptions and kingdoms of this world and set up his own kingdom. It is a summary, an overview of the rest of the book. It foreshadows and pictures the things that are yet to come in the book of Revelation. We're going to read and learn about the chastisement of Jerusalem or Israel in those first verses, verses 1 and 2. We're going to read about the mission of the two witnesses in verses 3 through 12. And then we're going to read about the rescue of the remnant in verse 13, the Jews who truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So you have your books open to Revelation, the 11th chapter. Let's go head on and get jiggy with it. Let's go head on and dig in. Revelation 11 and 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Let's look at the second verse, and then I'm going to explain what I just read. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Let's break that down so that way we can understand it. The scripture says there in the first verse, a reed like unto a rod. So uh, it says, and there was given me, who, 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 who's me? John, because John's telling uh, the story here. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out. Don't measure that. Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And we'll explain all of that. And the holy city shall be, uh, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. A reed like unto a rod. This refers to a bamboo-like reed that grew to a height of 16 to 20 feet on the banks of the Nile and the Jordan rivers. It was common. It was a common measuring rod used at uh, construction sites. So it, this this uh, reed, like unto a rod, was this bamboo device that was used for measuring, uh, uh, like a measuring rod at construction sites. Check this out. John's measurement of the temple is a symbolic action. To measure something means to claim it for yourself. I remember somebody mentioning that they had sold their home and uh, the new owners had, uh, before, at, right, at, right when they sold their home, they were still living in it, but they were making progress to move out. And the new owners had uh, brought over an architect to measure various areas and to recommend various changes that, changes that the new owners wanted to make. And I remember the, the, the buyer saying, I mean, the, 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 well, the, the seller saying that uh, had the architect shown up previous to the buyer's commitment, they would have thrown them out. But because they no longer own the home, and this was at the request of the new, uh, of the new owners, they let them in. So by God instructing John to measure the temple, that means that he owns it. The Lord was saying through John, I own this city and this temple, 
and I claim it for myself. You know, when we, those of us who are parents, we can bust up into our children's room to do some measurings. We can bust up into our children's room at any time. Amen. We can tell them to unlock this door because I own, this is how many people have heard this in their, in their parents' house. Or how many of you have said this? This is my house. I can come in here and measure. I can come in here and do whatever. This is my house. Okay. The temple John saw was the restored temple that will play a great role in the tribulation. So during this time uh, where John saw the vision, in reality, the temple was destroyed, but the he saw in this eschatological uh, vision, in this uh, future vision, he saw uh, this temple in place and he saw the temple restored. And because it's going to play a great role during the tribulation period, Jerusalem will be the center. Again, again, I, I got to go back to President Trump naming the capital of Israel, you know, Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. That was very important, very key, okay, Jer because Jerusalem will be the center, the vortex of the tribulation. One more time. Jerusalem will be the center, the vortex of the tribulation. Let's go further. The rod can be used to measure a building for construction or for restoration. Or it can be used to measure a place for preservation or protection. God can be saying that he wants the temple and the Jewish people measured for judgment and correction. That in the last days they must be judged along with everyone else because of their unbelief, their denial, the rejection and blasphemy against God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how many people watch Back to the Future Part 3 where uh, Marty with Fly was sent back to the Old West. And I don't know how many of you remember that where he uh, came up with a name uh, because he was from the future. And he figured he would use a name of somebody, of one of his favorite uh, Western people. He used the name Clint Eastwood. And the people around the city were calling him Clint Eastwood. And he got into a fight with Mad Dog Tannen. And there was, there was scheduled a gunfight. Uh, and everybody was betting against, uh, against Clint Eastwood, which was Marty McFly, because Mad Dog Tannen was a beast with the gun. And so uh, the undertaker of the city uh, came up to Clint Eastwood, Marty McFly, and he started, he had a measuring tape. And he was measuring him. And, and, and Marty McFly said, what are you doing? You know, but I guess he figured it out that he was measuring him for destruction. What John did was especially significant because the Gentiles had taken over Jerusalem. That's where that scripture says uh, we're about trampling Jerusalem underfoot there. Uh, Gen the Gentiles had taken over Jerusalem and the Antichrist had broken his agreement with Israel. We're going to read about that. Uh, he's going to break his agreement. Remember, we've been teaching that in the beginning of the tribulation period, remember the rapture is going to happen right after the rapture begins the seven year tribulation period. We know according to scripture, which we will read through Daniel, through the prophecy, uh, it's divided into three and a half years each. Three and a half plus three and a half equals seven. Okay, and we're going to read about that through the scriptures. The first, uh, he's going to be introduced when uh, that first seal is open and he's going to come out on to be the rider of a white horse. White represents peace. It's a false peace. So for that first three and a half years, he's going He's, he's got an agreement with Israel that he's going to protect Israel. He's going to look out for them. But halfway through, and even as Daniel prophesied in the book of Daniel, thank you, James uh, Leon Long, he's going to break his agreement. How many people know that the enemy is so good at breaking his agreement? How many of us have been hurt by people who came into our lives saying one thing, but the enemy came in who used them to break 
their agreement. I'm not going that far, but you know what I'm saying. Many of us have been there. How many people have been through that? And that's how the enemy does. He doesn't keep agreements. He gives you a false peace. He gives you a false uh, prophecy. He gives you false. All of these things about the enemy is a false reality. And when the real him shows up, and many of us have experienced that, the Antichrist, as we're going to read, halfway through the tribulation, after the first three and a half years, in the midway, he's going to break his agreement. And, the, and now he was about to use the temple for his own diabolical purposes. Those of you that need to reference that, put down 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, the third through the fourth verse. Put that down for your notes so you can go back later and read that we're not making this stuff up, okay? You're going, it's right there in Scripture, right there, uh, not only in the Old Testament, in Daniel 9 and 27, but it's in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, the third and the fourth verse. Let's go ahead and see what Daniel 9 and 27 says. Let's just kind of make sure that we got it. I'm going to read the Living Bible version. It says, this is prophecy. Watch this. This king will make a seven-year treaty with the people. I just said that. Didn't I just say that? That during that seven years of tribulation, it's right here in Daniel 9 and 27. It's right there. This king, that's the Antichrist will make a seven-year treaty with the people. God bless you, Nika. But after half that time, I just said it, right? Three and a half years, half of the tribulation, half of that seven-year treaty, half, but half that time, he will break his pledge and stop the Jews from all their sacrificing and their offering. See, so... I, I, can I teach for a minute? Can I teach? During the first three and a half years, he appears, this Antichrist appears on a white horse. He appears in this peaceful state. He signs this treaty with Israel and this agreement that he's going to protect them. And part of that protection is giving them the false uh, temporary uh, permission. Yeah, go ahead on and worship. Yeah, you do your thing there. Go, go ahead and do that. You're right. Uh -huh. Go ahead and go ahead and worship. It's, it's all good. But Daniel prophesies here that he will break, but ha after half that time, Daniel 9 and 27, he will break his pledge and stop the Jews from all their sacrifices and their offerings. Many of us have seen, I got to jump to relationships so we can tie this together. Many of us have been in relationships where in the beginning, they let you do a lot of things. In the beginning, it was all good. In the beginning, it was, you know, they, 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 they didn't mind what you had on. Matter of fact, that's what attracted uh, them to you, what you had on. But after the three and a half years, the real enemy showed up and the things that were permissive in the beginning. I'm talking to somebody who's in a marriage where somebody has changed. You married them. And I'm going back to the scriptures, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Your marriage and yeah, please share this message. Sonia, please share this message. You married them and, and all of a sudden they, they changed up. And the things that were permissive in the beginning to lock you in and to deceive you. Now the real them has shown up and they no longer are a symbol of peace. All right, let's go forward. Let's see, Daniel 9 and 27, I'm reading the, the Living Bible. It says, he will break his pledge and stop the Jews from all their sacrifices and their offerings. Then, as a climax to all of his terrible deeds, the enemy, the Antichrist, will utterly defile the sanctuary of God. How he's going to do that? They they call this the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Halfway through the tribulation point, after the three and a half years, he when he changes up, he is going to move into the temple. See, during that first three and a half years, he's going to give them a false sense of security. And this is where uh, the temple will be rebuilt. And, he, and he's letting them think the temple is going to be rebuilt 
for their purpose so they can worship and it's going to be in peace. But he's he has an ulterior motive and it is so he can move in halfway through the tribulation. And that is going to be the abomination of desolation. That means is when he moves in, he's going to have a statue uh, erected inside the temple and he's going to require everyone to worship it. That's going to be the, he's going to desecrate uh, the sanctuary. So the scripture is saying that uh, the enemy shall utterly defile the sanctuary of God. It was just spoken way back in the Old Testament in Daniel 9 and 27. But in God's time and plan, his judgment will be poured out upon this evil one. Let's find another place. Let's see, let's see where else it says. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. I told y'all to, to write it down, but we're going there. Thank you, Sonia, for sharing this with some of your groups. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 4. I'm, le really, I'm reading the Living Bible version for your understanding. For that day will not come until two things happen. First, there will be a great rebellion against God. And then the man of rebellion. Who is that? It also calls him, uh, uh, they said the man of rebellion will come, the son of hell. It calls him the man of rebellion. That's the Antichrist. Also, it calls him the son of hell. Okay. Fourth verse says, he will defy every god there is. Because there's going to be other gods. They worship all kinds of gods. They'll be worship all, worshiping all kinds of gods during that time. Uh, he will defy every god there is and tear down every other object of adoration and worship. He will go in. Here it is. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 4, what I just said is right here. It's going to show you I didn't make this up. He will go in and sit as God in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. This passage of scripture is saying that he, the Antichrist, will sit in the temple of God, declaring that he is God, that he, that is that he and the state can meet the needs of man and bring utopia. Utopia is paradise or heaven to the world. These scriptures clearly say that the Antichrist is going to appear in the temple, even in the very holy place of the temple. This means that the Jews must rebuild the temple, like I said, in Jerusalem before this event can ever appear. At the time of John's writing, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Nearly a million Jews had been slaughtered and the temple treasures had been carried off to Rome. That was at the time of this particular writing. But John, uh, through the vision, had saw, Jeruz had saw the temple rebuilt. Jerusalem, let's split, explain this part. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, said Jesus, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's in Luke 21 and 24. The time of the Gentiles began in 606 BC when Babylon began to devastate Judah and Jerusalem. And it will continue until Jesus Christ returns to deliver the holy, holy city and redeem Israel. That's prophesied in Zechariah, the 14th chapter. See these scriptures here in the Bible? Everything means something. God doesn't leave just stuff loose out there. He ties it in. Uh, Luke 21 and 24, let's just see what it says there. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles. Watch this. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right, let's talk about the inner court and the outer court. Remember he told him to measure the inner court and not to measure the outer court? The inner courts, which is the temple proper, was the worship center for Jews only. No Gentile was ever allowed within these court barriers. Surrounding these courts for Jewish worshipers was a huge outer court. So the inner court was smaller, of course, and the outer court was bigger. Uh, the outer court was considered the court of the Gentiles. This was the closest a non-Jew could get to the temple without falling under the death sentence. Why would the Gentile court 
and the city of Jerusalem not be measured for judgment. Remember, he was, John was told to measure the inner court, but not to measure the outer court. God bless you, Minister Jermaine Minor. The reason why is because they were all ready to be under the Antichrist and his government. The government of Israel and the other governments of the world will have already submitted to the rule of the Antichrist. Uh, remember I said, that gave you that example about that homeowner? He's only going to measure what's his. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Because they will already be under the Antichrist and his government. That's why John was instructed not to measure the outer court. That, that wasn't his, but measure the inner court. The government of Israel has already submitted to the Antichrist, but this will not be the case with true Jewish worshipers, nor with true Christian worshipers, nor some other strong worshipers of other religions. The Antichrist will have a problem securing the loyalty of people all around the world who have strong faith during this time. Strong Jewish worshipers will do what they have always done. They refuse, they will refuse to buckle down under any Gentile ruler. This passage, verses 1 and 2, is a prophecy. The temple will be destroyed and Jewish worshipers will be persecuted. The Antichrist is going to attack them with a vengeance like never before seen in the history of the world. So the scripture teaches us, watch this, that the Antichrist will rule for a seven-year period. Both Christ and Daniel say this. Christ says the abomination of desolation will launch the worst tribulation the world has ever seen. In his own words, the signs that occur up until the abomination of desolation are called the beginning of sorrows. That's in Matthew 24 and 8. And the trials after the abomination of desolation, watch this very carefully, takes place are called the great tribulation. Man, I'm getting ready to kind of unfold this. Stick with me. Stay with me right here. Let me say that again and let me go deeper. So in his own words, the signs that occur up until the abomination of desolation, remember, that happens halfway through the tribulation period, that right in the middle of that 33, that 33 when the, the, this Antichrist is going to change. And he's going to, yeah, 24, Matthew 24 and 8, Tequila. He's going to move into the temple. Uh, in his own words, the sign that occur up until the abomination of desolation. So whenever you hear that, you know that's midway tribulation point. Are called the beginning of sorrows, as in Matthew 24 and 8. And the trials after the abomination of desolation that takes place are called the great tribulation. Watch this. The first three and a half years of the tribulation, really the whole seven years is called the tribulation. But the first half is called the tribulation. After, according to scripture, according to Matthew 24 and 8, after the abomination of desolation takes place and the Antichrist moves into the, the temple, it's going to shift and it's going to be called the great tribulation because it's going to be tribulation so great that they are unparalleled by anything man has ever seen. Okay? So let's, let's see what it says. Let's, let's break it down. We're going to see it. Daniel also gives a division of time just as Jesus Christ does. Daniel 9 and 27 says, And he, talking about the prince, who shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the Antichrist. Remember I said that he was going to, uh, for the first three and a half years, he was going to uh, align with Israel and confirm a covenant with them. This is Daniel here. He just kind of, we're just kind of breaking this down some more so you can see how the prophecy uh, is true and unfolds itself. And he, the prince, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. We're going to explain what that one week is. And in the midst of the week, in the midst of that three and a half, got it? He shall cause the overspreading 
of abominations. In the midst of the week, which is Daniel's pro prophesied, yeah, Don, Don Harold Lopez, which is, which is Daniel's 70th week that is prophesied, definitely points to a period of time, one week, that is divided into two parts. I'm going to explain it thoroughly. Note these factors. Daniel was dealing with the 70th week, the end of the 70th week prophecy. Two facts tell us that Daniel was also dealing with the end of time, just as Jesus Christ was. One, the fact that Christ was dealing with the end of Jerusalem and the end of the world. And two, the fact that Jesus Christ said he was, he was elaborating on Daniel's prophecy. Daniel said that what begins the second half of his 70th week is the abomination of desolation. You got it? It's okay. You might have to kind of, you know, replay this and back it up. I'm going to go a little bit deeper to kind of, kind of, kind of help you. The words of Christ should be carefully noted in Matthew 24 and 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Jesus is telling the, the folk right here, when you see the abomination of desolation, remember that, that halfway mark when the Antichrist spoken of by the prophet, he's letting them know that, then let him to know that time. Christ was about to elaborate and explain in more detail what Daniel had prophesied. Thus, Jesus Christ explained that the first half of Daniel's week would consist of signs which were the beginning of sorrows. And the last half of Daniel's week would consist of unparalleled trials of great tribulation. The second half of the week would be launched by the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. All right, another matter that needs to be looked at is the time frame of the end time, the 70th week as predicted by Jesus Christ and Daniel. Scripture refers to the length in these words. Daniel 7 and 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until, watch this, here it is, the, the, three, the, the first three and a half years, here it is, watch this, a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years, and I'll explain it. He, that's a, it's, it's in words, but it's actually new, it's numerical for three and a half years. It's right here in the prophecy. At the end of verse seven uh, of chapter Daniel chapter seven and twenty five, it says, uh, "And think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until until a time and times and the dividing of time." Okay, let me let me see if I can. Let's let's see. It says it somewhere else about the other half. Watch this. Daniel 12 and 7. Remember what I said, a time and times and the dividing of time. Remember that. Keep that in the forefront. That's three and a half years. And I'll explain it. Daniel 12 and 7 says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the rivers, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever. It shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So according to Daniel 7 and 25 and Daniel 12 and 7, uh, which is also echoed into other numbers in Revelation 12 and 6. Revelation 12 and 6 mentions this period as 1,260 days. Revelation 11 and 2 
and in Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6, uh, indicates that as 42 months. So, based upon the days and months given in the book of Revelation, if Daniel then his words, watch this, here we, we're going to explain it. When he say a time, that means one year. Then he says times, that mentions two more years. So time mentions, you see it's singular. Times mentions plural. Time mentions is one year. Times, two more years added to the one year, that's three years. And half a time, that means, the, which is equal to three and a half years. See, it's right there. That's where uh, we're able to uh, extrapolate from, from the text there, from the prophecy, and understand the time frame of the tribulation and understand the halfway points, the seven-year tribulation total, what's going to happen in between. Daniel stated that the abomination of desolation shall be executed in the midst of the week, that is, after three and one-half years. It is assumed that Christ's words... The beginning of sorrows, that is the first half of the week, are also three and, a, and one half years. Thus, in combining the two periods of time, three and a half years each, the length of the last days or the end of time is said to be a literal seven years. I'm sure we got that now. Okay? I'm sure you got that now. All right, let's go on. Verse number three of Revelation chapter 11 let's get to the dawn harold lopez her favorite part let's get to the witnesses and i will give 100 i think we got a break in the connection i'm so sorry that the connection's weak tonight i'm so sorry y'all i'm still uh, y'all still here all right let's go back and read revelation chapter 11 and 3 it's the technology on this and it's not y'all amen uh, but we bind the enemy amen and Pray for a clear connection. All right, here we go. 11, Revelation 11 and 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. I already got a message from uh, Anika and also um, Dwayne to keep on going. So we'll keep going. Okay. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Whenever we see that someone is clothed in sackcloth, sackcloth is the clothes or garment of mourning. Let's read the fourth verse. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. These two witnesses, when, when, when the, the symbolism of these two witnesses uh, being mentioned as two olive trees and two candlesticks, the olive tree means blessing. Mm -hmm. we, we're gonna, and we're going to read about that. Okay. Uh, so the two uh, olive trees symbolizes that these two witnesses are, are going to be able uh, to bless and the uh, two candlesticks mean light. The two, okay, so uh, the two candlesticks means light. So they're going to be both, it says here, the two olive trees. That's fourth verse. Means uh, they're going to be the blessing. Olive tree means blessing. Uh, remember, and they went out to the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Blessing. And light. Uh, two candlesticks, which means light, okay? Fifth verse here. And if any man will hurt them, let me show you how powerful these two witnesses are, and we'll explain more about the witnesses. We're going there. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So these two witnesses that God is going to send down during this uh, particular time, during the tribulation period, are going to be both blessing and light. And these are not just going to be uh, two humble and weak uh, saints. They are going to be enabled and endowed with 
fire that will proceed out of their mouth. So when the enemies come up to them to try to hurt them, um, they will be killed by the fire that they will at will be able to spew out of their mouth against the, that will kill, instantly kill the enemies. We're going to talk more about them in a minute. Verse 6 says, These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So they're going to have power to shut down heaven where it won't rain. If they decide that it's not going to rain at will, they can shut it down. It won't rain. Uh, it says also, and have powers over waters to turn them to blood. So not only will they be able to shut up heaven from rain, but they, they can actually uh, speak, speak to turn the waters into blood and the last part says, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So at, at random, not only will they be able to uh, spew fire from their mouths and instantly kill their enemies, but they will also be able to pass judgment. If they don't want it to rain, they, during, as they prophesy, it won't rain. Uh, they, they can turn the waters to blood. They can smite, they can smite the earth with plagues uh, as often as they will. Let's talk about the ministry of, the, of these two witnesses. Is this all right tonight? Are we good? The place is Jerusalem. Lord have mercy. And the time is the first half of the tribulation. Israel is worshiping again at its restored temple. During the first half of the, tribu of the, of the tribulation period, uh, Israel is glad because they're, they're, they're worshiping again under this false peace they're back in the temple the temple's been restored built under the protection of the antichrist who gave them permission to build whose true character has yet to be revealed we know we're learning this by inculcate the word inculcate means to keep you we learn by rote by keep repeating the same thing over and over you're going to have this so you're going to have this so well so down pat because you because we're inculcating we're repeating uh, many factors of revelation uh, over and over again. You're going to know this well, and I thank you for hanging in there with me. Let's let's go. Let's go. Sixty three people are with us right now. Let's let, let, let's let's go. The place is Jerusalem, and the time is the first half of the tribulation. Israel is worshiping again at its restored temple, built under the protection of the Antichrist, whose true character has not yet been revealed. The two witnesses minister. During the first half of the tribulation, okay, which according to Revelation 11 and 3 is 1,260 days. Jerusalem, what, 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 Pastor, what is that? What is that? Okay, what is, what is 1,260 days? That's three and a half years. Y'all playing with me. It's just. God is confirming it all throughout his word. 1,260 days is the, is the three and a half years that, according to the scripture, that they are going to, uh, these two witnesses are going to be able to minister. And it's going to be during the first half, half of the tribulation. And Jerusalem is then for 42 months. What is 42 months? Three and a half years. The last half of the tribulation their witness is related to israel and the temple how tragic that the power of god and the word of god will be outside of the temple and not within as in the former ages when the temple was in place like the temple that jesus left this new house will be desolate these two men are specifically called prophets in, 11, in Revelation 11 and 3 and verse 6. And I take this to mean prophetic ministry in the Old Testament sense, calling the nations to repent and return to the true God of Israel. Let's talk more about these two witnesses. Not only do these two witnesses declare God's words, but they also do God's works and perform miracles of judgment, reminding us of Moses and Elijah. Some students cite Malachi 4, 5, and 6 as evidence that one of these witnesses may be Elijah, but Jesus applied that prophecy to John the Baptist in Matthew 
13. John the Baptist, however, denied that he was Elijah returned to earth. This confusion may be explained in part by realizing that throughout Israel's history, God sent special messengers like Elijah's to call his people to repentance. So in this sense, Malachi's prophecy uh, will, be fulfilled, will be fulfilled by two witnesses. So instead of relating the ministry of these two witnesses, because if you, if you ask biblical scholars and biblical teachers and those who study theology and the doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine of eschatology is the doctrine of last things, the book of Revelation. Whenever you hear that, the doctrine of eschatology is the doctrine of last things, the doctrine of, of Revelation. We're reading about uh, the doctrine of last things. Whenever you hear anybody talk about all kinds of people have all kinds of different analogies, and especially the super preachers who want to be super deep and, and try to say who these people are. The Bible here does not say who these two witnesses will be. So if the Bible says that, I mean, even similar, and even it's the scripture that said that uh, Elijah is going to return there. Uh, and, and, and here too, it says, instead of relating the ministry of the wilderness, wilderness to Moses and Elijah, the angel who spoke to John connected their ministry with Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah, the fourth chapter. These two men helped to reestablish Israel and Palestine and to rebuild the temple. It was a discouraging task, and the Gentiles made it even more difficult. But God provided the special power they needed to get the work done. This truth is an encouragement to God's servants in all ages, for the work of the Lord is never easy. And that was talking about back in Zechariah, the fourth chapter. But since it doesn't mention who these people are specifically, we've got to go with that and just leave it at that. Some people, again, feel that it's Moses. Some people feel that it's Elijah. Some people feel um, uh, Elijah and Enoch because both of them uh, were caught up. And, you know, there's, there's many uh, examples of who some people think it's John the Baptist. And, again, we don't know. It doesn't say. We don't know. I've got this saying, where the Bible is silent, so am I. So let's go on to what is in the text, what we do know, what we can extrapolate from the text. Uh, can we keep going? Let's keep going. Number seven, Revelation 11 and seven. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, the Antichrist, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Let's, let's break this down for you. That's why, because of this particular verse, this is why we know that these two witnesses will be operating during the first part of the tribulation. Because it, the, the, this Antichrist uh, won't be able to touch them until after when he, when he changes so it says, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast, the Antichrist, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Remember, we read that. Will ascend out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Watch this. It gets deep. Verse 8 says, and their dead bodies shall lie in the, in, uh, in the street of this great city. These two witnesses, they at one point, during the first three and a half years, they couldn't be touched. But God is going to release, uh, take his hands off of them. But it's, all, it's going to be for a purpose. He's going to take his hands off them, and the Antichrist will finally have power to destroy them. And as the, as the word says in, in the eighth verse there, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. We'll talk about that. Where also our Lord was crucified. To make sure the reader understands that Jerusalem is meant here, John added, where also our Lord was crucified. So John mentioned that so that you will know that again, all of this takes place in Jerusalem. Ninth verse. And they... 
of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So they're going to leave their bodies in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Those of us who know Jewish custom, uh, we know this is an utter affront to the Jewish culture because they require the Jewish culture always requires a quick and de dignified burial. Usually within a day, they 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 you know uh, they, they they the person's already buried. But because they hated them so, these people who uh, are of Satan's influence and the Antichrist influence are going right exactly dawn before sundown. They hate these two witnesses so much that they're going to leave them laying in the street dead for three and a half days. And let's look at verse number 10. It says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice of them, rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So when these two witnesses are killed by the beast of the Antichrist, folk all over are going to celebrate. They're going to be giving like presents out, like it's Christmas time or, or, or like it's Easter. They're going to be giving out presents to one another and they're going to be partying and, and actually uh, celebrating because of uh, they're going to be glad that these two witnesses are dead and lying in the streets and they're going to be laid there as a spectacle uh, for three and a half days. The martyrdom of the witnesses, that's what this is. This comes only when they have finished their testimony. God's obedient servants are immortal until their work is done. So they were immortal uh, for this particular, this first three and a half years. They, they could go untouched. Many of us know about superheroes and uh, in the comics. Most superheroes are immortal. You can't kill them. And for the first three and a half years, they are immortal for a purpose. So their work is completed. And how many of us know today God will protect you until your work is finished? Oh, yeah. God will protect you until your work is finished. I had a videotape. I used to be the organist and associate minister for Reverend Milton Bigham, and he was the executive producer of Savoy Records. And because he was the executive producer of Savoy Records, he was my pastor. And I also was the organist there at his church in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, because he was an executive producer, he everybody who, every recording artist who was under the, the label of Savoy Records uh, was his boss. And he was the boss of them, uh, Reverend James Cleveland. And, and you know, you can go, go on back and Reverend, uh, well, James Moore was Malico, which is associated with Savoy, but also, um, uh, you know, all of the, you know, James Cleveland, you know, all of those people, uh, I'm trying to think who else was. There was a lot of people who were associated with. Remember them back in the day. So a lot of gospel artists would come through there. So I, uh, the one particular service, this guy came through, and he was directing and playing for the Los Angeles Messengers. There was a, a choir out in in California, and it didn't mean anything to me because I didn't know who the guy was back then, but. I had a, uh, I kept, you know, kept the videotape of the service. We were all there. I was playing and everything. And I looked at the tape years later, probably about 20 some years later at my house. And I'm looking and it's Kirk Carr. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, this is Kirk Carr in service with, uh, with me. This is before he wrote uh, all of these songs, you know, all those songs there that he, um, for every mountain. Before he wrote for every mountain, Kirk Carr was just somebody playing the piano and directing the choir. But I'm saying all that to say that years before, when I'm in this service, because I was also uh, had to run the pulpit as well. I was one of the worship leaders for the pulpit. And Kirk Carr was in this service with us. He was at my church. And again, nobody knew who he was. I said all to say that that was years ago. And then I'm looking at what God did. God preserved Kirk Carr from that. that might, this might not mean anything to you, but I'm, I'm going to see if I, if, if I can make it relate. 
God preserved him from, from all those years back. So that way his ministry would unfold now. And I've come to let you know that God is going to protect you in your years of, of obscurity. Yeah, nobody knows you now and your gifts may not have gone forth now yet. But God is going to protect you so your works will be made manifest. Oh, my goodness. In the future. So hang in there. This COVID-19 season is not over for you. God still is protecting you because you've got work to be done. And as this particular time with these two witnesses, God protected them and made them immortal until their work was done. The beast, the Antichrist, after the three and a half years, is now in power and wants to take over the temple. But he cannot succeed until the two witnesses are out of the way. So God will watch this, permit him. Yeah, some, Valerie Dawkins Williams, somebody need to say, God, thank you for protecting me. I've got work to do. The enemy cannot succeed. The Antichrist cannot succeed until these two witnesses are taken out of the way. God will permit him to slay them. For no one will be able to make war against the beast and win during this time. Revelation 13 and 4. Once this halfway point comes, this beast is going to be uh, a beast. The whole world rejoices at the death of these two witnesses who have caused trouble by saying what people didn't want to hear. Words about their sin. Words that they needed to repent. And about the upcoming judgment. Nobody wants to hear that. Folk that are living in sin don't want to hear that. Sinful people hate those who bring sin to their attention. Folk avoid my Facebook page like the plague. They avoid the Revelation teachers like the plague. They don't want to hear about no sin. They don't want to hear about no upcoming uh, judgment. The witnesses will not even be permitted a decent burial. But even this indecency will be used by God. Watch this. God does everything for a purpose. To bear witness to mankind. People are going to watch this spectacle all over CNN. Or what they think is a spectacle. And they're going to rejoice over it. They'll watch it on C-SPAN. They'll watch it on MSNBC. They're going to be watching these, uh, the, this news report. Watching and filming uh, these things. These got these two witnesses dead on the street for three and a half days as everybody's partying. And but all of this technology and all of this, this news going out is for God's purpose. Everything God does is for a purpose. The earth dwellers will rejoice at their enemies removal and will celebrate a, a satanic type of Christmas by sending gifts to each other. Uh, it will appear that the power of these two witnesses is over. Verse 11 says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life, and they stood up upon their feet, <laughs> and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So for all this partying these folk were doing, God is going to allow the spirit of life to enter into them once again. And they're going to stand up on their feet. And a great fear is going to fall upon all of them which are, are witnessing this. Verse 11 says, I mean, verse, verse 12 says, And they heard a great voice from, from heaven saying unto them, come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud watch this and their enemies beheld them meaning that this will take place in the sight of all some people think that the enemy has successfully killed your ministry and God is going to breathe life back into your ministry and is going to call you back into a bigger uh, realm of ministry and the world is going to see it. Uh, they're going to see it. 
verse 13. And the same hour, right after this happened, there was a great earthquake. Picture this. And the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. 14. This second woe is past. Remember we read about that woe, woe, woe? This second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The resurrection of these two witnesses, it was a miraculous thing. Not only were they raised from the dead, but they were caught up to heaven. God rescued them from their enemies and gives a solemn witness to the watching world. The world's great joy fought suddenly turn into great fear. This fear will increase because right after there's going to be a great earthquake which is going to instantly kill 7,000 people. A tenth part of the city of Jerusalem will immediately collapse. Let's go further. Verse 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. We've heard that before. And it's in the hallelujah chorus. And he shall reign forever and ever. Verse 16 says, and the four and 20 elders, remember them, the 24 elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and they began to worship God. This is an amazing moment. 17 says, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come because thou art has taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. 18, and the nations were angry and the wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give Reward unto the servants that prophets, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Let us break this down as we get ready to sign off. We have been waiting since Revelation 8 and 13 for this third woe to arrive, and now it is here. It's coming, y'all. When the seventh angel blew his trumpet, three dramatic events occurred. An announcement of victory, verse 15. These great voices um, were probably the, the choir up in heaven. The great announcement that the kingdom of this world belongs to Jesus Christ. And of course, Christ does not claim his royal rights until he returns. But the victory, he's already won. Satan offered him the world kingdoms. Remember when he tried to tempt Jesus? But he refused the offer. Instead, he died on the cross, cross and he arose and he returned victoriously to heaven. All right. So no matter what, how difficult the circumstances might be or how defeated God's people may think they are, Jesus Christ is still King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he is in control. Even during this covid 19 season no matter how difficult these circumstances look we can still give god praise even around his throne because he is still king of king and lord of lords he is still definitely most definitely in control i know the enemy may try to come upon you y'all to make you feel depressed and make you feel saddened but when the enemy tries to put you into that spirit i implore you to think about how great and mighty he is and start to give him a spirit of praise even these things that are taking place in the in tribulation the tribulation period the church ain't going to be here for that we're not going to be here for that so we can give God in that the elders left their own thrones and prostrated themselves in worship before god's throne they gave thanks for three special blessings 
that he supremely reigns, that he judges righteously, and that he rewards righteously. All the good that you've done, God hasn't forgotten. He's going to reward you. Uh, he's going to reward you. In Revelation 4, 10 and 11, the elders praise the creator. And in Revelation 5, 9 through 14, they worship the redeemer. Here the emphasis on the conqueror and the king. He is the conqueror and the king. Verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. An insurance of God's faithfulness. This chapter opened with, a temp with the temple on earth. But now we see the temple in heaven. The focus of attention is on the ark of God, the symbol of God's presence with his people. In the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, the ark stood beyond and behind the veil. In the Holy of Holies, God's glory rested on the ark and God's law was within the ark beautifully illustrating that the two must never be separated. He is the holy God and must deal righteously with sin. But he is also faithful. He's a faithful God who keeps his promises to his people. It was the ark of God that led Israel through the Jordan and into their inheritance. This vision of the ark would greatly encourage God's suffering people to whom John sent this book. God will fulfill his promises. This is what John is saying to them. He will reveal his glory. And he's, John is saying, just trust him. Once again, John saw and heard the, the uh, portions of a storm. Greater judgment is about to fall on the rebellious people of the earth. As we go forward uh, tomorrow into uh, chapter 12 judgment is about to, greater judgment is about to fall on the rebellious people of earth but god's people need not fear of the storms because he's still in control the ark reminds them of his presence of his promises and on that ark was the mercy seat on which the blood was sprinkled back in the day the day of atonement as in leviticus the 16th chapter verses 15 through 17. We could read about that, how uh, the priests went in, uh, the, the, the high priests went in to the inner portion of the tabernacle, the inner sanctum, uh, there where the ark was, and they sprinkled blood upon the mercy seat uh, for the sins of the people. And um, during the day of atonement to deal with the national sins of the people. So even in wrath, God remembers his mercy. So tomorrow, let's prepare ourselves because the stage is now set for the dramatic appearance of the beast, Satan's masterpiece, the false Christ who will control the world. So thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you for going the extra time. Thank you for wanting to be here for the extra time. Thank you for following along with me and praying along with me. I pray that you got something from this. Again, the, these videos are on my wall. Those of you that have missed uh, or want to catch up with the previous 16 episodes or one of the 16 episodes, you can catch those on my wall. There, just scroll down. You can find them, or you can find them all on YouTube under my my name. Just put Daryl Cherry in YouTube, and you will find them there. I bless God for each and every one of you. This is a unique time for us. God has allowed a sea law in order for us to have this time to be able to go through Revelation. Remember, Revelation 1 and 3 says, I'm closing with what I opened up with. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time 
is at hand. I love you all. I bless God for you all. And let's just continue to trust God. Continue to open up your word and read and go back through these videos and hear these, uh, go back here and get these notes and take them down and, and understand uh, the, the word of the Lord. So I love you all. We're going to trust God through this season. I know um, the enemy wants to perplex you and wants to bring you down, but we're more than conquerors. And, and I dare you, even after you sign off, I'm going to sign off in two seconds. Before you do anything else, before you go get something to eat or get your snack or go to bed or, or you go watch a little TV, before you do anything else, I just want you to think about how good God has been to you, even in the midst of this, this, this situation. And I want you just to give God praise for who he is. Just start to give him praise for what he's going to do. Thank God for his way of sparing you. Amen. Just like I gave you that example about Kurt Carr when I didn't even know who he was and, and I was right there with him and walked right past him and, and was in service with him and was presiding in service that he was in and uh, giving instruction for his choir to sing and when they weren't going to sing and all that. Didn't know who the guy was, but God was preserving him for years later to write for every mountain, to, to, uh, to preserving him for all of the songs that he was going to write in his ministry. God was going to preserve you for your ministry. I love you all, and I bless God for each and every one of you. God bless you, Mom Ball. God bless you all.